Praise the Lord. Praise God. You know, we just got done singing about a Jesus who who rose from the tomb. And I, I've been studying this week in John chapter 11 when Lazarus goes to the tomb and uh, Martha, his sister, is crying. And Jesus comes to Martha knowing that he will resurrect. Is this thing on? And he will resurrect Lazarus from the grave. And Jesus doesn't look at Martha and her weeping and say, don't worry, I got this. I'm going to raise him from the dead. Jesus comes to Martha and what does he do? He empathizes and he starts weeping with her. And so sometimes we forget that Jesus was a human. He empathizes with all our emotions. And many of us have come into this place today with areas of our heart that are broken in need of healing. And so I've been ministered to uh, by Justin and the band. I will be ministered here in a second to the word and to the Lord's Supper. But I want to invite you into the healing process. Uh, this is not a religious check in the box. We come in on Sunday and we've, we've dropped our, our coin in the, the box. We've dropped our card in the box. We've done our religious duty. But God wants to meet us here. This is why we gather. Because we have brokenness that needs to be healed. My name is Pastor Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Convergence. We are really grateful. Uh, Jade, Jennifer, myself, and Carolina got to go to the SOMA annual retreat this week. And so that's why we asked Justin and the fellas to lead. They did a great job. Let's thank them again. Thank you, brothers. Thanks for serving us that way. And in a second, uh, our brother Bob will come up and preach. And the reason we do this, so when we get away for the week, we can actually get away for the week. And I have to focus on preparing a message. Um, but I do want to welcome all the guests that are here. Uh, again, brother said earlier, but if you'll fill out a card, uh, we're not going to hunt you down and track you down and make things awkward. But we do want to pray for you. So every card that's filled out, we do pray for you. If, if you're a, 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 not just a guest, but you're a member here or someone who's been visiting for a while and you have a prayer request, fill out the card, put it in the box, and we'll be praying for you. Um, just by way of announcement, uh, we're a family integrated church, if you haven't noticed. And what that means is kids are going to, uh, like you did when you were one years old, you're probably going to cry and wiggle around. And that's cool and that's okay. But uh, just a reminder, if, if it gets out of hand, uh, if your kid starts becoming disruptive, um, we would ask politely that use the nursing mother's room. It's a training room. Uh, the sermon will be um, live streamed down there. So just you can go down there and your kid can get out some of the wiggles or, or whatever's going on. Uh, you'll be able to hear the sermon, watch the sermon. But, but we love the kids, so that's not like a diss on the kids, but uh, just an opportunity for us to, to stay focused in on the message. And I want to introduce to us Brother Bob Loman. Bob, if you go ahead and come on up. Uh, just by way of introduction, Bob Lohman has been a real blessing to our church. Uh, he came and prayed at our first service here. Uh, Bob is the head of the Metrolina Baptist Association. Those that know Bob, Bob, I don't know if you know this, but you're a man of prayer. That's what you're known for. Um, I go around and tell people that, hey, I'm, we're at Metrolina Baptist and Bob Lohman. And Brother Ed even told me, I, I know about Bob. He, he's that guy that prays and he's a, he's a man of prayer. So that's a great thing to be known for. Uh, Brother Bob has served as a mentor to me as I've looked to men with no hair, no offense. Um, in our church, we've, we're kind of, I'm one of the old guys in the church, so it's good to have an older guy to, to just walk with together. Bob has been a blessing to me. Uh, Bob's wife, Carla, is here. And Carla, what's your friend's name? Josie. Josie. Josie's from China. And we want, we want to say hi, Josie. You want to stand up? Welcome. Everybody welcome Josie. Thank you for coming. Um, Brother Bob, I just want to pray for you guys in Metrolina. Is there any specific prayer requests for Metrolina before we get going? Okay, our team's retreat this Tuesday, making plans for the years. So okay. Praying for that meeting and okay. we'll be in the center of what God's doing. Okay. Uh, Father, thank you so much for Bob and Carla and just their ministry of prayer. Uh, Lord, what an awesome thing to be known by because prayer is an ultimate symbol that we need you. And so Bob is a man who's saying, I need you, Lord. And so I pray, God, that we would take Bob's example and we'd be a church, we'd be individuals, we'd be families who are known as people who are dependent and needy upon you, God. And that we would hit our knees daily uh, throughout the day. We would pray without ceasing, Lord, showing our ultimate dependence that it is not us getting the work done, but it's you. You're doing the work, Lord, so we, we rely upon you to do that. And we also pray for Metrolina as the leaders will be meeting this Tuesday. God, would you give them Holy Spirit-inspired vision to help reach our city, to go to the ends of the earth here in Charlotte, but also to the ends of the earth across the globe, that you would use the hundred or so churches in the, the network and that you would uh, have kingdom collaborations that, that exceed far beyond the walls of a church building yes, and that your name would be known here in Charlotte and throughout all the globe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks, man. Y'all welcome, Bob. Oh, there, we go. there we are. <laughs> Welcome. It is good to be together today. Uh, privileged to be with you at Convergence as we come together for worship this Sunday morning. Uh, it's especially a privilege because my office is through that window in the next building. So um, it's exciting uh, to see how God's work to bring us together here in this place. Um, and now with seven churches meeting here on a regular basis, um, we're a busy place, but it's a, it's a privilege to be able to serve together. Actually, this is the first time I've preached at the center since we opened. So, I mean, I've done other meetings, spoken in our annual meeting, but first time I've spoken in one of our churches, actually second time I've spoken in one of our churches, but the first time I've spoken in this room in one of our churches. So, uh, it's a privilege to be with you today. It's also good to have my wife, Carla, here today. You already met Carla and Josie, but in, in the interest of serving our pastor's wives, I need to make sure you know something. I did use her name at that point, but the sermon hasn't officially started yet. Um, I say that because as our daughters are growing up, anytime I use their name in a sermon illustration, they got a dollar for every time. The girls did. Anytime I use my wife's name, she got a dress. Okay. She used to not hold but she started doing that lately. So I'm having to be very careful. Actually, in our churches, our churches have learned that. And um, as one of our churches I was in last week, I used her name. And one of the ladies raised her hand and she said, that's another dress. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, but um, maybe I'll get a little grace today. We'll, we'll see. All right. It is good to be together. We're going to jump in together to look at, at the... Uh, this passage from Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 to 16. Um, but before we read that, let's kind of set the stage for studying this passage together. The title of the sermon, as we spend this time in God's Word together, is Determined Devotion. So, that said, we're 19 days into 2020. How are you doing on those resolutions? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. How many of you are actually sticking with the resolution you set at the beginning of the year? I want to see a hand. 19 days. So we have some faithful ones. Good. All right. It's good. Um, if, if you're struggling, that's okay. We're just 19 days in. Hang in there. We're, we'll get to the end of January and we'll see what happens next. But I mean, some of those resolutions normally deal with better health, uh, weight loss, etc. Um, other res New Year's resolutions are more spiritual in nature. I mean, some folks determine they're going to read through the Bible in a year, which is great. Actually, let me tell you how that's worked for me. In the past, I always struggle with the 12-month plan because I get to about the fifth or sixth month and I just wane, you know. But I found a 90-day through the Bible plan. Now, that's a lot of reading, but I can focus better in 90 days than I can in 365 days. So, just just a little, little free hint there. But anyway, we have resolutions. That's good. Being faithful to them is a good thing. But being faithful to the God who made us is even better. Amen? I mean, now's a good time, especially this close to the beginning of the year. Now's a good time to evaluate our devotion to God. Now, as we talk about devotion, you may say, what exactly are you, are you talking about devotions? No, I'm talking about our devotion, our commitment to, our dedication to, our consecration to God. Those are four words that basically mean the same thing. So the question I want to start with today is, where is your devotion focused? Where is it focused? What are you devoted to? How focused are you on your object of devotion? Now, for the Christian, 
our ultimate devotion is to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, that's, that's where we, that's where our allegiance is, that's where our commitment is, that's, He is the one we follow and are committed to. We sang about that, we prayed about that, that's the way it is. But, I think for those of us who have been Christians for long enough, recognize we can't assume that devotion, though, can we? We can't assume that we're going to be as strong in that devotion as we need to be. And we can, we can also be un, uh, committed or devoted to an unworthy object. There can be something in our life that we're really devoted to that we don't even realize it. Until somebody gets our attention and helps us to see it. So today, we're going to see a biblical example of determined devotion. Devotion to God and His purposes for us. Our goal during this time together is to study this biblical example of determined devotion and evaluate our own devotion to God to see what we need to do to practice such devotion personally, to practice such devotion as a church family. Daniel is our example today, along with his three companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as they're known more popularly in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These four young men from Judah, exiled with many of their people to Babylon, who had conquered their nation, took them away and set them apart. Daniel and his and the others, including many more than just the four of them, were to be educated for three years, then presented to the king as servants. So that sets the stage for our text today. If you would, in honor of God's word, would you stand with me as we read this portion of scripture and say with me, what I like to say very often before I read God's Word. Just repeat it after me. Here it goes. When I open my Bible, God opens His mouth. Do we believe that? Well, then let's pay attention, okay? Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. Listen to what God's Word says today. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in a worse condition than the youths who are your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Quick interpretive comment. I'm going to lose my head if I listen to what you're saying. Verse 11. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So we listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance. I love the way the ESV reads here and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were given to drink and gave them vegetables. Lord, speak to us through your word today. Help us to hear clearly through this story in your word, which is true. Help us to hear clearly, Lord, what determined devotion can look like and needs to look like in our lives for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. You'll be seated. All right, as we look at Daniel 1, these verses in Daniel 1, question to think about. How can God's people, how can we resist the pressures that can squeeze us into conformity with the world? Romans 12, 1 and 2, in those verses, Paul urges us not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in full devotion to the God who loves us. As we read this passage, we see that Daniel and his friends were transformers. They weren't conformers, they were transformers. Instead of changing the world, being changed by the world, they did the changing. 
They did the changing of the world. God used them to transform the minds of powerful leaders and to bring great glory to his name in a pagan land. So, how did they do this? Look at the text today. We're going to take the pieces apart. First, resist the temptation to detour from devotion. Look at verse 8. Focus on that verse with me for a few minutes. How can those who follow Jesus resist temptation in order to remain purely focused on our devotion to him? Daniel resolved his commitment, his perspective in terms of devotion, was that he would not partake of the food or wine that was provided by the king of Babylon. He resolved, he determined, different translations say different things. He resolved, he determined, he made up his mind, he set upon his heart what he would not do. This is one of those, I'm not going to do this situations. He resisted the temptation to detour from devotion. I mean, he and his friends decided to avoid the luxurious diet of the king's table as a way of protecting themselves from being ensnared by the temptations of Babylonian culture. Now, we're reading this, saying this just eh, 20 some days from Christmas. If I were to guess, I would say most of us indulged in some pretty rich foods over Christmas. And all God's people said, amen. Okay. Now, that that doesn't mean that all rich foods are wrong. That's not the point here. The point is, where are they from and what will they lead us to do? That's what Daniel was concerned about. With this restricted diet they were asking for, they would be continually reminded as they ate it in this time of testing that they were the people of God in a foreign land. Babylon was where they would live, but Babylon would never be their home. Let that sink in. Daniel made a conscious and determined effort to say no to temptation and yes to God. Simply put. Now stop and think about it with me for a minute. Where does every temptation that you and I face, where do they all start? Every temptation. Okay, I'm getting two answers, but they're both right, okay? Normally I say up here, but really it's more heart. It's not that we get drug into something. It's like times I've counseled with married couples where one has been unfaithful and one says, oh, I just, it just, this just happened. No, it didn't. You thought about it, didn't you? You see, it all starts up here. It all starts in our hearts. It all starts in what we're thinking. Daniel gives us example of being determined, determined to resist temptation with his head, with his process of life, as it might be in order to honor his commitment to God and God's law. Now, this devotion is demonstrated over the issue of diet. Interesting. Not something we would necessarily focus on regularly, but we would eat and drink. Now, some of you may have been on a Daniel fast before. It's close to this. That's where it came from, where the idea came from. But Daniel here is focused on what they're going to eat and drink. And basically he's decided because of their devotion to the Lord and his law and his ways that they want to be pure as followers of him. Now, sometimes we act like our devotion is only supposed to be focused on big things, large concerns, significant behaviors. Our devotion, though, is often influenced by what may seem to be small things, but end up being large things. Significant issues. What do we eat? That's Daniel's concern here. What do we watch? And I'm going to quit preaching and go to meddling for a minute, okay? What do we watch? What do we listen to? What's important to us day by day? I used to think, yeah, I'm getting older now, don't have any hair, all that kind of thing, but I used to think, oh, that stuff doesn't matter. The older I get, the more I realize, yes, it does. Let me give you an illustration. My spouse, I mentioned earlier, whose name will not be mentioned at this point. Um, but uh, one time it was during the Lenten season and I was just, I was wondering, what, what are we going to fast during this period? Sometimes, usually I'll do that, something. And I decided to give up television for 40 days. Now, this is a long time, this is before Netflix, this is back in the days of channels, okay? Things you had to actually had to turn, you know, we're talking the 1900s, okay? So, but I gave it up for 40 days, honest. And at the end of the 40 days, Easter, back in those days, when you want to watch a movie, a lot of times a good movie was on Sunday nights. 
Okay, so Easter night, I'm going to watch a movie. And my bride, ooh, I was close, almost used name, but, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, we were there in the room, just the two of us. And you know how you guys, we guys, um, I'm not put, pinning this on the ladies, I'll just make it a guy thing. We're very familiar with where all the buttons are on our remotes. You know? Yeah, you know that. I mean, you don't have to look at it. You know where to turn it off, you know, change the channels, you know, turn up the volume, etc. I'd gone 40 days without looking or holding that remote, and I forgot where the buttons were. That's important to remember, okay? The movie's getting ready to start. I'm sitting in my recliner, getting ready to watch the movie. My bride is behind me. I didn't know she was standing there, but she's right behind me. And commercials are on before the movie started. And this commercial came on with this risque topic, some scenes of couples, et cetera, that I probably need to look at. And it shocked me so much, I dropped the remote trying to get the button changed. And I hear somebody laughing behind me. Folks, I just went 40 days not watching television and it changed my perspective of what was appropriate to look at. See what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying we need to be legalistic and don't watch TV. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what we eat, what we watch, what we listen to, those, are, those things influence us. And they can impact our devotion. So we need to be careful about them. What is important to us day by day? And, and how often does comfort decide our behavior instead of devotion or instead of holiness? Now, why are we considering these questions? Not so that we can practice some kind of, of empty or hollow legalism that poorly imitates devotion to God. We're asking these questions so that we can resist the temptations that come our way to detour from devotion to God in order just to do what feels good. We want to do what's right, like Daniel and his friends did. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord empowers the believer to take a bold stance in faith turning from temptation to do what's right. So with this kind of devotion and a readiness to resist temptation, Daniel approached the officials to ask them to provide what they knew they needed. So let's go to number two. Oh, next one, I'm sorry, number three. Next one. Be gracious in devotion. And this may take us a bit of a different way than you expect, but we need to pay attention to this. Verses nine and 10 give us this concept. It's one thing to resist temptation. Okay. It's another thing to do so in a humble and gracious way. Now, Daniel noticed that Ashpenaz, who was the chief of the eunuchs, was friendly and kind to them. He had taken a liking to these, these boys from Judah. And they recognized that this favor was God's hand at work in their favor. So Daniel asked in a humble way for permission not to eat the king's diet thus defiling himself. He stood his ground, but he did so with grace and humility. He wasn't arrogant or rude in the process. He wasn't obnoxious or stubborn. He kindly and nicely won over the man in charge. Warren Wearsby, who's now in heaven, but a great Bible scholar, said this. He said, throughout scripture, you'll find courageous people who had to defy authority in order to obey God. And in every case, they took the wise and gentle approach. Romans 12, 18 puts it this way. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I mean, Christians, how, how often do we hurt our witness and turn people away from God with attitudes that may be angry or arrogant when we expect, expect, express excuse me, our convictions? I mean, is it not our responsibility to do everything we can to win others to Christ? Convincing them of the grace and love of God in Christ Jesus? I mean, how can we do that by acting in a way opposite of grace and love? We can't, really. These four Jewish students didn't threaten anybody. They didn't stage a protest. They didn't try to burn down a building. They simply excelled in their studies. They acted like gentlemen. And they ask politely for a change in their diet. So we need to be gracious, gracious in our devotion. Next, we need to be wise 
in our devotion. Look at verses 11 to 13 to see this. Actually, you're seeing grace and wisdom in all these verses, but here we focus on being wise in devotion. As Daniel was gracious, he was also wise. Ashpenaz hesitated at his request because he was afraid he'd get in trouble and literally lose his head, right? So what's the alternative? Daniel exhibits a wisdom beyond his years that could have only come from God when he suggested what he said next. Now, it looked like there, was, there were only two options. Either they defiled themselves eating the king's food or they, uh, they didn't and Ashpenaz lost his head. But Daniel, however, proposed a third option in which everybody was a winner. Notice he came down the chain of command to the next guy, the guard or the steward who was assigned to he and his friends, and suggested the alternative. Test us for 10 days. Just let us eat the vegetables, drink the water for 10 days. Only vegetables to eat, only water to drink, and then examine us. So Daniel asked for a test. One that essentially put God to the test, if you look at it. Because he believed and trusted that God was going to honor their convictions and their commitments to obey his word. In our devotion, we must have and practice wisdom. Why? Because as the old hymn says, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The struggle in this world is real. You hear me? The struggle in this world is real. We know that. It's dangerous. It's spiritual. But if we in our devotion apply the wisdom of God to the circumstances of our lives, we're able to emerge victorious and vindicated on the other side of the world's trials and challenges. Chuck Sundahl put it this way. He said, in a world with people who rebel against the divine king, it's inevitable that believers of all ages will face circumstances and situations in which their convictions will be challenged. We who are parents need to prepare our children for those occasions by both teaching them God's truth and modeling integrity for them. And all of us who are Christians need to personally commit ourselves to living God's way regardless of the temptation to live otherwise. This is what Daniel and his friends, it's what Daniel and his friends had been taught. This is how they would live or die devoted to God. All right, let's go to number the next one. Trust God to honor your devotion to him. We see this in verses 14 to 16. To resist temptation, Daniel asked grace, with grace and wisdom, that he and his friends have vegetable and water for 10 days. Simple request. Acceded to. They allowed him to do it. He and they trusted God to honor their devotion to him with favor in the process. And he did. After 10 days, the four Jewish boys were healthier in body and better looking than all the other students. Like I said, I love the way the ESV reads it. They were better in appearance and fatter in flesh, meaning they were healthier looking. Hudson Taylor, great missionary to China, put it this way. He said, unless there's an element of extreme risk in our exploits for God, there's no need for faith. Yes, Daniel and his friends took a significant risk when they demonstrated Determined devotion, fueled by faith, trusting God to honor that devotion to him. He did. He honored it. He did it then. He does it today. When it comes to solving the problems of life, we must ask God for the courage to face the problem, humbly and honestly, for the wisdom to understand the way through it, the strength to do what he tells us to do, and the faith to trust him to do the rest. Our motive and devotion must be the glory of God, not finding a way to escape from our problems. The important question, another important question we need to ask is, how can I, excuse me, let me rephrase that. The important question is not, how can I get out of this? The question needs to be, what can I get out of this? How can I make it through this challenge to see God's way to the other side? 
The Lord used this private test to prepare Daniel and his friends for the public tests that would come in the years to come. If your devotion is focused on God, all things are possible. I'll say that again. If your devotion is focused on God, all things are possible. And he'll work to glorify himself and bless you in the process of living that devotion out. So today, are we fully devoted to God in word, action, and attitude? Are we ready to practice a determined devotion that demonstrates grace and wisdom day by day? Even in the challenging moments to come? In light of everything we've talked about today, in light of what Daniel and his friends did, put a verse you may not have thought inserting into that context there. It's from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that, in, that all things work together for good. For those who love God, are devoted to God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you know the Lord today, review your devotion to him today. Evaluate where you stand with him. Pastor Brian's going to help you walk through that in just a few minutes. But one other question. If you don't know Jesus today, if you're not a Christian, today's an opportunity to begin that life of devotion with him. Will you think about that? Will you pray about that? Will we all ask the Lord to help us to evaluate where we stand so that when a new day comes tomorrow, we'll be ready to walk into it and trust him to be the determined and devoted followers He's called us to be in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for helping us to hear what the Spirit's saying to your church. Lord, help us to live out today who you've called us to be. So that when others see our lives, they'll recognize that we're devoted not to ourselves, but to the God who loves us. To the Savior who died for us to the King who rose from the dead to give us life. We praise you, Lord, together, and thank you for your work among us, even in these moments and in the moments to come. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everyone said, Amen.